Welcome to the A Sound Effect podcast, the podcast about sound effects. My name is Ashwin Andersen, and I'm the founder of asoundeffect.com. And I'm Christian Hagelskjær, founder of Hertz & Bits Sound Effects. For this episode, we have a very important topic for audio professionals, hearing loss, right? That's right. Jennifer Walden spoke to Dr. Steve Taddy about preventing uh, hearing loss, and uh, he has a background in music and audio engineering and audiology, so he really knows the subject. And I think many of us working in audio and music has have probably had some kind of scare in this regard. So this really is a must hear. That sounds really good. And as always, there have been some interesting new releases from the Soundfix community. Yes, as always. Uh, this time we have some modern UI sounds, some very nice sounding field recordings from around England, and a large pack of video game foley. And last but not least, some singing bowls. Well, let's hear it. Video Game Foley Essentials Volume 1 by Sonic Bat is Foley sounds cut specifically for video game development. Everything from buttons and switches to doors and footsteps. Smart UI by Epic Stock Media is a one-of-a-kind collection of modern user interface sound effects with a punchy sound. Sounds of England, Volume 1 by John Silke is a collection of random soundscapes from everyday England. Singing Bowls by KEDR Audio features metal and glass singing bowls of the kind used in meditation and yoga practice. Next up is an interview with Dr. Steve Taddy about hearing loss prevention. Hey, this is Jennifer Walden for a sound effect. Today we're talking about an important issue for anyone working in sound. Whether you're a mixer, editor, foley artist, composer, your hearing health is essential to doing your job. So joining me today is Dr. Steve Taddy, who has a background in audiology, education, and audio engineering. Dr. Taddy's mission is to improve awareness of hearing conservation and improve hearing health through preventative measures because those involved with sound are frequently exposed to potentially hazardous sound levels. So, hey, Steve, thank you so much for joining me. First, can you tell me a bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, Jennifer. Thanks for having me here on the Sound Effect podcast. So my name is Dr. Steve Taddy. I'm an audiologist audio engineer, and I also teach at a couple different uh, colleges and universities. My background is in music and audio engineering, and that kind of led to audiology uh, for reasons that we'll, we'll talk about today with just hearing loss and hearing injury. Uh, but currently what I do is, like I mentioned, I teach, and then I also host and produce a, a podcast through Hearing Tracker, and through there we, we focus on hearing loss, hearing injury, hearing health, the really cool technologies that are out there and uh, trying to tell people stories. And yeah, that that's kind of where I'm at right now. Just having some fun mixing, mixing the audiology world with audio engineering. Awesome. So of course, anyone working with sound, I mean, they're exposed to sound pressure levels that could be too loud. So what are dangerous sound levels and are sound pros really at risk? Yeah, this is this is a, a great question that can be a little tricky to answer. And the reason being, when we talk about hazardous sound levels, it's it's kind of a two-variable equation. You know, we're talking about how loud is the environment or source, and then how long are we exposed to it. And the analogy I like to use often is kind of sun exposure. If we think of if we're out on the beach 
uh, let's say in California midday, if we're going to be on the on the beach for five hours, we need to wear uh, sunscreen or just protection from the sun. If we're going to be running from our car to a building, we don't really need to worry about that. So it's both how loud is it and how long is it. And then it's not that if you get sunburn once, you have cancer, but it's cumulative over the years that a little bit of damage, a little bit of damage, and it's additive. And that's what we see with ha- hazardous sound exposure. So uh, when we look at it, there are some regulations that try and quantify and give us like time-weighted averages for this how loud, how long equation. And the, these uh, regulations are set by both OSHA and NIOSH. And uh, you can kind of think of it as OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They're the law of the land. And then NIOSH is best practices. And uh, I know I still haven't a- answered your question, like what is hazardous level? And it's, it's tricky, but if you want a decibel value, around 85 decibels is the level that you're starting to fatigue your hearing system. And it's not that at 85 dB, now you have hearing loss, but in this concept of like dose exposure over time at 85 decibels is where we start seeing that accumulation of dose where there is a physiological cost to our actions in that that sound environment. And to, uh, to give you a reference, you know, normal conversation is generally around 60 dB A weighting. And to bring this into this engineering world um, where we are, you know, a drum kit is a very common offense um, w- with sound exposures. And they can range from 90 to 130 decibels, depending on the kit, the player, the acoustic environment that we're in. So right away, you can see if 85 dB is the fatiguing level, a, a drum kit, if we have exposure to that in like a tracking session, uh, we're, we're well over that. And a snare drum, a single snare hit can be well, well over 100 dB. So we, we really do see high, high exposures in these cases. And, you know, as engineers, we sit in studios most of the time all day. And then when we finish our work on one project, we go home and we work on another project. And depending on what type of engineer you are, you have, you know, mics set up. And I think we've all been placing mics on a drum kit and maybe, you know, putting a, a, a kick mic mic inside the head and then the drummer will like slam on the kick drum and your head's like right there or the same thing will happen with cymbals the snare mic so there, there's lots of exposure in that the tracking you have the tear down the mixing and editing process and uh, certainly live sound engineers they have it bad too because you have to ring out the system you have the concert crowd noise tear down so it's just lots and lots of long noise exposures and it's just required by our jobs and there are some stigmas around it too, right? That, oh, it must be loud so that you can, quote unquote, like hear or feel the music. So, uh, kind of, yeah, kind of to summarize that, you know, anything above that 80, 85 decibels, you're on the road to some hearing injury or at least sustaining a physiological cost um, from that noise exposure. So one of your podcasts was about hearing loss prevention measures for kids. Um, Because you mentioned drumming, let's look at the example of like a a high school marching band, right? You got the kids on the drum line and they have the snares and the toms and the cymbals and the bass drums. And they're right there practicing with these instruments. They're literally right on top of them. So would you recommend uh, hearing protection for kids in high school marching band? Absolutely. And there's a lot more to it than just hearing protection. Um, But yes, that would be something that we would recommend. And uh, definitely getting regular hearing tests. There are different things you can do with within this like larger arc of like you mentioned while you're practicing and the the average musician professional musician will practice around five, five and a half hours per day. And obviously, that's not the same as in grade school. a symphonic band, but uh, yes, the little things like that can really go a long way wearing hearing protection. And you should train to hearing protection too, to know it's a little bit of a tangent, but you know, a lot of people they'll put in earplugs and they'll say, okay, these don't, these don't sound right or they don't sound natural. And it does take some time for our brains to reacclimatize to them, but absolutely. Uh, then something when you have hearing conservation programs for like school orchestras, that should be a discussion. Hearing protection devices, either in individual practice um, during orchestral, like the, the full band practice, and certainly in other situations too. 
So another thing that you brought up was length of exposure. It's not uncommon for re-recording mixers to be on a stage for 10, 12 hours, you know, sometimes longer than that when they're at the end of a project. So in situations like that, what can they do? What would be some helpful things for them to do to prevent hearing loss over time? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a really fun question for me because I think what most people will, the, the most common approach will be wear hearing protection, we hear a hearing protection device. And for many people, what this will mean is they'll try like one of those foam ones that I'm sure you've seen, like the rolly foamies. Yeah. And people don't like these because they, they really reduce a lot of the high frequencies. So it makes it sound unnatural. It's almost like speech would kind of become something like this where you can't really hear it anymore. And uh, it's difficult to get them in, so people don't tend to, to then wear them long term. So the more holistic approach to this, if we're talking about hearing conservation, there's what's called a source path receiver approach. The last one, receiver approach, being hearing protection devices. So if we only focus on those, we're only focusing on a third of what we can do. And if we focus on all of these, the source, source the path, and the receiver, it can actually it'll help our hearing. And then it can help our engineering work, too. So they're related, which is a really nice relation between them. We're just, uh, it's, it's nice that it works out that way. So for this, the source scenario, um, you know, for re-recording engineers, we don't have to monitor the speakers so loud. Let's try and control the sound at the source. If it's something where we're listening to speakers, we don't have to crank it to a level where our ears are bleeding. We don't have to monitor over speakers' headphones. And... A lot of people will say, well, then you lose kind of the vibe, you lose the bass. And in a way, that's true. Uh, but my counter to that would be, based on our physiology, if you listen at softer levels, so if you, if you turn the volume down, you can actually hear with more detail. With how our, our, our hearing system is def designed and with our cochlea, you'll actually be able to hear with what's called more critical bands. So you'll hear more detail and with less, less distortion. And when we turn it up, uh, another thing we can do is just take breaks. You know, we don't have to mix for nonstop 10 to 12 hours. If we run out to get something to eat, make sure you're not then going in your car and cranking the music or going into another room and listening to loud sounds. Give your ears a little bit of a break. That's a, a really big part of it, too. Um, and so that would kind of be the first step, like source. What can we do at the source? And the next one would be a path one. And this is to try and stop or decrease that propagating acoustic energy. And, you know, if we're in a recording situation, we can put loud sources in a separate room. That's probably the easiest thing that we can do. Literally put a barrier, a wall, a giant baffle, doghouse, use acoustic shields, anything like this that will, will try and reduce that sound that's getting to us and allow us to hear a little bit better. I think a... Uh, and a, a truly obvious one that's often overlooked, uh, Jennifer, is acoustic treatment, too. Uh, I mean, we, we spend so much time in studios, and a lot, of, a lot of people work from home now and have home studios. And if you acoustically treat a room and you do it, you do it half decently, you can actually decrease sound levels in that space by up to 10 decibels in some situations, which is a, an, an incredible um, decrease in, in sound pressure levels. And then, of course, by doing this, by acoustically treating a room, we're going to improve our ability to record in that space to make accurate listening decisions on microphones, on preamps, on, on sound effects, just because the room isn't going to be coloring and kind of lying to us about what the actual sound sounds like. And then the last one is just wear hearing protection. And, uh, I mentioned those rolly foamies, and in my mind, these are kind of like wearing a welding mask to protect your eyes from sun. Uh, it, it's overkill. And there are plugs that are designed specifically for musicians, and they're just called musicians' plugs. But they'll work all the same for audio engineers. And by design, what these do is they attenuate or reduce the overall sound pressure levels in a more linear or equal fashion across the spectrum. So it does keep things sounding more natural. And, you know, you can get these in custom forms from an audiologist, but you can also go online and purchase them for, for 20, 30 bucks. Like they're, they're really cheap. They're really accessible. 
And uh, I mean, the ones that like the industry standard that I'd recommend would be Atomotic Research ER20s. And uh, and that's really it. Learn how to wear them properly, because if you don't, they're not going to function all that well. And I, I guess the last thing I'd say about that is, you know, there are in-ear monitors you can get. There are sound isolation headphones. You know, there's like the, the Shure SE425s. You can get closed back headphones like the Bear Dynamic DT770s or um, even the Vic Firth. They have some pretty much earmuffs that are that offer offer sound um, through them, like through a, through a plug. But so it's, it's kind of a, a three stage process if we try and limit our sound exposures. If you do have a 10, 12, 15 hour workday ahead of you, which is which is lots of fun, just try and keep levels down with speakers and instruments if you can. If you can't, try and put some space between you with baffles or barriers. And then if you can't do that either, uh, then wear hearing protection, appropriate hearing protection like musicians plugs when it's possible. And if none of that's possible, Definitely be sure to take breaks. You know, don't don't expose yourself to nonstop sound throughout the day. Our bodies, they need some time to recover from it. Are certain frequencies more damaging for hearing than others? So this is this is a really interesting question, and um, I can answer it pretty easily. And I, I want to say just no. For the most part, regardless of what sound exposure you have, our hearing system is going to receive kind of a, sa- a similar physiological cost. And what we see is with noise exposure, we get what's called a noise notch right around 4,000 hertz. And it can vary a little bit up, a little bit down. But we have to realize any sound that gets to our brain at first is picked up by our pinna, a little satellite dish on the outside of our ears or on the outside of our heads. It then funnels that sound down into our ear canals, and it's, it's a resonator. Right, our ear canal is a basically a, a, a tube, so we have a very strong resonance in there, and because of this peripheral system that we have, we see uh, our hearing system amplifying around four thousand hertz, roughly between sometimes it's three to six thousand hertz. So that's where we see injury happening, and you know if there can be some some variance, whether it's lots of low frequency noise versus like impulse sounds from firearms, but for the most part. If it's loud over that 85 dB A weighting level, regardless of frequency, there is still going to be, like I said, you're, you're kind of on that road to sustaining some hearing injury. So if someone's blasting a dog whistle in your ear or something higher than like 20K, which is, you know, outside of the, the range of human hearing. So you're not exactly picking it up, but, you know, those sound pressure levels are there. So just because you can't hear the sound doesn't mean that it's not damaging your hearing? Well, I, okay. So that's the only, the only caveat here. Our hearing generally is thought to go from 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. And, you know, as we, we age that 20,000 Hertz, the, the high end, it kind of starts dropping down to 16 K 12 K as we get older and older. So anything outside of that range, our hearing system isn't going to respond to, or the cells at least, and uh, the structures within the cochlea, they're just not going to respond to it in the same way. So, yeah, you could you could probably hit someone with, let's say, 30 kilohertz and crank it in 120 decibels. And there might be some other some other uh, like crazy <laughs> physiological issue, um, but it, it's not going to influence the cells quite the same as if it's like 2000 hertz, for example. Our hearing system just isn't tuned to anything outside of that range. Got it. Got it. Okay. So how does noise damage our hearing system and what is the result of that hearing injury? Yeah. So uh, Jennifer, I'm sure we've all kind of been in this situation where we go to a concert and you leave and your ears feel like a little fuzzy, right? And you might have a little ringing, a little buzzing in your ears. So that is a sign of hearing injury. And a lot of times people will just call it like a temporary threshold shift because, oh, it's temporary. It lasts a few days, maybe a week, and then it comes back. But actually, it's more more accurately called a compound threshold shift. So if you're out there, you're an engineer, if you experience that where after a day's work, after a show, you have that decrease in audibility, fuzzy feeling tinnitus, you have injured your hearing system. Now, it might seem to recover, but it's just there's still like kind of a subclinical injury that's that's existed. 
And the mechanisms behind that, you know, we have these very, very tiny specialized cells deep within our hearing system in this, this structure called the cochlea. And these little cells, uh, they're made to function and pick up sound. And uh, I'll use another analogy. It's like if, if I had to run for two minutes and then I took a rest, I'd be fine. But if I had to run for 45 minutes, I'd, I'd probably die. <laughs> and I, I would just pass out. And I'm, I'm not conditioned for that. And these little cells are similar where they can take some, some beating, but then if you give them a break, they'll, they'll kind of recover. They'll be able to clean themselves out. But with that, that example you gave with a 12, 10, 12 hour day, the cells, they end up having what's called metabolic exhaustion where they don't have enough time to clean out the toxins that are just a natural byproduct of their function. Those toxins build up. They can then cause injury to the cells and or just completely cause the cells to die. And then we have a certain number of these cells, around 15,000 per year, and then they, they, we just start losing more of them and more of them and more of them. And uh, this results in hearing loss, but also some other issues. So, Jennifer, it's more accurately, we can call, call it something like a music-induced hearing injury. And we see it being a decrease in audibility. That's what most people think, hearing loss. But you can have tinnitus as well, which, you know, professional musicians, they have a, a higher risk of around 50% of having tinnitus compared to the general population. And, you know, I know I mentioned musicians and not engineers. There's really not a lot of research out there, unfortunately, looking at the sound exposures of engineers and it's difficult because there, there's so many different types of engineers you can have front of house you can have you know uh, like a tracking engineer a mastering engineer foley artist so uh, it's difficult but i would put them pretty pretty close on a similar platter and i think that would be a fair assessment but so you can have tinnitus you can have uh, something called hyperacusis which is um, a sensitivity to moderately loud sounds like if you're doing Foley work and someone falls down and you have to slam, let's say, kind of a wooden barrel against um, against the floor, where that would actually cause you like physical pain because your hearing system is damaged. And uh, you can have other other cochlear distortions as well. Um, an example of this would be imagine if you were strumming a guitar and you heard like the E string, but it sounded like there was this aliasing tone with it where every time you heard that E string, there was kind of a, a dissonance that was accompanying it. So there are cochlear distortions like that that can result from long-term hazardous noise exposure. And uh, it can definitely affect our ability to distinguish speech and start detecting temporally fine structures like speech and noise too. And you know, hopefully in a way that this, this is kind of a, a wake-up moment or it scares a little bit some listeners because everything you do as an audio engineer relies or is a filter through your hearing system and or it should be so if we can't make decisions on instruments mic preamps uh, uh just eq decisions compression because our our audibility is decreased we have tinnitus we have sensitivity to loud sounds other distortions where it's difficult for us to perceive these these very small you know timing changes like with compression like attack and release or maybe even small uh frequency changes it, it really does have an effect on your your ability to work, and then also without question, just your your ability to live, and uh, yeah, it, it's this bigger picture of just music induced hearing injury. It's not just a decrease in audibility, but it mainly starts with that cell exhaustion that I mentioned. And is hearing damage, uh, hearing injury, is any of that reversible? Or once the damage is done, that's it? Yeah, thank you for asking that because I forgot to mention it. It it's permanent. So as of right now, we do not have any means of restoring hearing. Now, there are some companies that are doing lots of research to try and have a pharmaceutical. Imagine like you get hearing injury uh, and maybe you take a pill or you get kind of an injection and it helps restore some of the functionality of those cells. But we're not there yet. So the safest thing to do is assume that any noise or music-induced hearing loss it is going to be permanent and cumulative over your entire life. Yikes. It, it's a big yikes. But the fortunate thing is, Jennifer, is we can do something about it. You know, one of the, the most common type of hearing loss is cell damage, sensory neural hearing loss. And of that, arguably, one of the most common um, factors influencing that would be noise exposure. We just have very noisy lifestyles. 
So one of the most common types of hearing loss then is completely preventable with that source receiver, uh, source path receiver approach I mentioned. So while it's a yikes, it's also a really good thing because we can we can do something about it pretty easily too. And that would be the hearing loss preventative measures that we discussed earlier, like the musician earplugs and taking breaks and what else? Yeah. You use acoustic treatments, you know, treat your room. And I'm, I'm a huge proponent of just doing stuff DIY. You know, you can purchase Orlex foam and you can, you can spend thousands of dollars on it. And you can take a DIY approach and get some Owens Corning 703 or Safe and Sound, just any type of um, more dense, rigid absorption, porous absorber. And for a couple hundred dollars, you can do a, a very efficient job treating your room. Now, of course, it's not going to sound like Blackbird Studio. Yes, it's going to take a lot more work to get to that that level. But for very little output, you can treat your room, which will, will it can bring, bring levels down. And certainly it will help your engineering work. Uh, use things like isolation headphones, like really. And I think engineers, if you're a tracking engineer, uh, you kind of have a duty. If you're working with clients, make sure that you're protecting their hearing too. And I can, I can give you an example. Back when I used to track before I got into audiology and hearing conservation, uh, I worked with lots of bands in the kind of south suburbs of Chicago. And invariably, if we were tracking drums, by the end of the session, I would have my headphone amp for the, like the drummer completely maxed out and and they would still be asking for more volume. And I'd say, okay, well, how can I give them more volume? Let me just throw a limiter on the tracks and, and just <laughs> decrease the dynamic range so that it's, it, it's perceptually louder. And just overall the dynamic range is decreased. So it is louder. And I, I look back and I cringe and I, I, I did such a disservice to those musicians by not providing them with a set of like the Vic Firth isolation headphones, a set of Shure SE 425s or some type of sound isolating earphone where you're going to block out the room and then present them a more comfortable, healthy level. And, uh, and, and it's really simple. Also, take breaks, turn the volume down. You know, our hearing system is not made to function at 100 decibels, 90 decibels. So you don't need to mix that loud. You really don't. And by the end of the session, like you said with the drummer, the volume just keeps creeping up and creeping up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. And if you find yourself doing that, it's, it's a great moment to step back and say, oh, geez, uh, I need to take a break. And uh, I, I don't know about uh, you, Jennifer, if uh, you experience this, but I know like when I'm, I'm mixing a project or editing it as well, uh, you know, you start off and you get so much done in the first, let's say, couple hours. And then after that, it's kind of like you're asymptotically approaching nothing where <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're not making as smart of decisions anymore. Right. And you might be doing like cyclical work like, oh, let me compress this. Oh, now I compress it. I need to EQ it. Oh, now I need to go back and compress it. So uh, I, I think if you find yourself doing that, and for me, it's really helped to mitigate both of those issues. If you say, I'm going to work for for this set amount of time that maybe is a little bit less than I want. So if I'm going to mix a song, maybe I'll give myself two hours. And I say, okay, I'm going to mix for two hours, and then I'm going to get out of the seat. And there's my break. And then also it gives my ears and my kind of just brain a sense to separate from the project. And even if it's 15 minutes, and then when I come back, my ears are refreshed and I can... I can make better mixed decisions too. And does OSHA have a recommendation? Is there a magic ratio? Like, you know, for every two hours you work, take a half an hour break. Is, is there some sort of magic equation for the proper amount of time to let your ears rest? Um, so there are magic equations, not so much for rest time, but when OSHA and NIOSH, when they make calculations for hazardous sound levels, it's what's called a time weighted average. So they average out the loud spots, the, the soft spots into this eight hour period because OSHA is certainly considered with, you know, occupation in the standard eight hour workday. So what I recommend people do, and I have this on my phone too, uh, there's a, a free app from NIOSH. And if you just type in NIOSH SLM, which stands for National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health Sound Level Meter, 
This will do that magic equation for you where you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you open the app up. It has lots of education for the things we're talking about today, like that 85 dB threshold. Um, what is hearing protection? But you can hit play on it, and it will start recording. And it will function as what's called like a dosimeter where it, it measures your personal exposures in a way. And it will give you peak levels. It will give you a time-weighted average. And it will then assume that that's going to be a constant. And it will continually be averaging the exposures. So if you are working in a session, you could pull up the, pull up the app, put it on the desk next to you, similar to where you're sitting, and get a sense if you're close to that 85 and uh, or if you're a little bit over it. And then from there, you can just gauge how, how much of a break you should take. Wow. I love that there's an app for that. That's so easy. <laughs> right. Because it's crazy. There are, there are so many equations that are going behind both OSHA and NIOSH. And uh, you can wrap your head around it and go crazy. And at the end of the day, it's like, that's not what people want to do. Uh, so yeah, the app makes it really easy. And uh, you can be one of those nerdy people like me when I'm at the like a movie theater, I'll pull it out and I'll check. And, you know, even, you know, movie theaters are so loud. You'd be surprised how loud like city noise is. And I went to college, I was in Chicago with the L and uh, and that's where it comes back to cumulative. You know, if, if you're in a session for 10 to 12 hours, most times when you drive home, you'll be blasting the music or you'll have the window open. Or if you live in the city, you'll be riding the L. So it, it's it's so much more. It's just pretty much constant noise exposure nowadays with our with our busy lifestyles. If there was one thing that you wanted listeners to take away from this talk, what would that be? Yeah. So there's a lot of information that we covered today. And it's really hard to wrap your head around it, and you can definitely do research. But what I would recommend is see an audiologist, and certainly one that is familiar with hearing conservation, and certainly one that's familiar with music and audio engineering. Because you should be getting your hearing tested on a regular basis if you're in the audio video world. Think of it if you were a, a uh, if you were an athlete, you would get general physicals to make sure that your body is functioning properly. So that you can keep doing what you're doing with your lifestyle and to make money. And, and that's what we do with audio. We're constantly exposing ourselves and we need to make sure that our hearing system is working the way it's supposed to. And if you do wear hearing protection, if you get a hearing test, you can make sure that the, you know, this source, source path receiver, that the methods you are uh, applying, that they're actually working. If from one year to the next you start seeing a degradation of your hearing, you know that you need to change something. So, yeah, I guess that would be my first thing. Make sure you're you're doing your hearing system justice and following up with a professional who can provide this information on an individual basis for you. And if I can piggyback off of that one other recommendation, because I know not everyone likes to go to the, the doctor. I'm certainly one of them. Uh, but... I mean, this is kind of the call to action. Like after after you listen to this podcast, like you can go online, spend twenty dollars, splurge, and get yourself a set of musicians' earplugs, and get ones that have a keychain, or get ones that have a little little dongle that you can connect to your keys. And the reason why I say this is because no one wants to be that person who is like late for the party or is late for the movie or the, the, the session because they're trying to find their earplugs. So if you have them on your keys, you will always have them with you. So that way, if you are exposed to hazardous levels, you don't have to worry. Just take out your keys. You'll have them. You can pop them in your ears, and, and then you'll, you'll have that protection. It really has been, uh, this is something that I do, so it's, it's Kool-Aid that I've, I've drank as well. It, it's so easy. Just get, get ones that have keychain and... Uh, it still surprises me. I get a little smirk every time I end up going to a bar or a place where there is noise and I can pop them in. And I, you really do hear better. Uh, I'll, I'll pose that to anyone out there. Next time they're exposed to lots of noises, um, start off like a concert. Start off with your earplugs in. And then halfway through the show, pop one of them out and you'll just hear all the crazy distortions that are in your hearing system. Uh, so you, you really do hear better if you have the right type of earplugs because your hearing system can function at a more nominal level if you want to think of it like that with the preamp. Except for our hearing system isn't like a Neve where you crank it in and it sounds good. If you crank our hearing system, it's not good distortion. And then you're also causing injury. 
That's so awesome. I'm definitely going to check those out for myself. Um, Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. This was such a great conversation and I certainly have taken a lot away from this. So thank you so much. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And if you or anyone else has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. Thank you. That's it for this episode. A big thanks to Jennifer Walton for doing the interview and to Dr. Steve Taddy for being on the show. Looking for more audio-related podcasts to listen to? We're part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. So be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org. Be sure to subscribe to the Sound Effect Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks a lot for listening and see you next time. Take care.